Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are and whenever you are. Welcome to the community live stream. This is October 8th, 2019. My name is Chuck Tomasi from ServiceNow, and I am here to do my best to answer questions in the community and give you the thought process, the journey of discovery, the reverse engineering, whatever happens to go through my head, tips, tricks, best practices along the way to help you take those skills to your organization and be a more effective ServiceNow administrator and developer. So let's get started. If you are watching this on YouTube, I am attempting to watch it on YouTube so that I can interact with you. But for whatever reason, it's not. We'll see where that goes. Might have a recording afterwards. I'm not seeing that we are live, although it is streaming. Had a couple of technical difficulties the last couple of days that precluded me from doing this. So apologize for that. But uh, those have been resolved and it's always something. You never know what's going to work until you actually hit the go button. So if you're watching this on YouTube, I encourage you to subscribe to the uh, channel you see right there, youtube.com slash user slash ServiceNow community. Subscribe, get notifications when other uh, pieces, uh, other videos are broadcast. Just checking the phone, see if I got my alert there. Have not. So who knows? Sometimes YouTube's a little slow. We'll continue to check throughout the show and see what happens. It's going to be one of those days again. So mark the, the what was it, the... Like button, that's it. Mark the like button if you find something useful, interesting, mildly amusing in this video. I appreciate it very much. We also do this on Twitch. You can find us over at twitch.tv slash now community. The last few videos are there. YouTube is forever. Twitch is for a couple of weeks. So see what you can find there. Appreciate it very much. And if you've got something more than a, hey, how are you? Good morning. I encourage you to post your questions, your issues, your problems, your requirements in the ServiceNow community. Be sure to put that in the proper uh, community area. If you've got a developer question about a client script, put it in the developer section. If you've got something on uh, predictive intelligence and reporting and analytics, find that area. ITOM, ITAM, there's a whole lot of different places in the community you can look. Just go over here, see if I can do this this morning, under communities, not a right click on that, over here under communities and you will see a list of some of them and then down at the very bottom, let me see if I can scroll to, nope, static header. There's one that says all forms or you can click this little plus right here and get a list of them that way. View all forms is there also, it brings you to the same list so that you can get the right audience for your question. I'm not just saying this to categorize and, and put things in the right pigeonholes, but you wanna make sure you get the right audience for your uh, question in the community. One question per post, please. Search before you post, typical community etiquette stuff. Be nice, be kind, offer help when you can. That's it for the community. Also wanna invite you over to the developer portal if you haven't been there. It's at developer.servicenow.com and you can find yourself developer meetups, free personal developer instance, running any of the latest three revisions. That would be New York, uh, what came before? M M Madrid and London, LMN. That's where we are today as we record this on October 8th, 2019. Get one of those, try it as a sandbox, test some of your skills, learn, grow, experiment. When you've got those things nailed down, you can bring those to your dev instance and implement them. Hey, I wonder if I could write a script to do this. Hey, I wonder if I could build a table or a flow to do that. Oh, I wanna check out the New York instances before we upgrade our organization. Great place to do that. All the scripting APIs are over there. Developer meetups, lots and lots of people getting together around the world. That would be on this tab and this button at meetup.com slash pro. You can also get there easily enough through the developer community. Over 19,000 people worldwide growing every day. We'd love to see you at one of these meetups. We're going to try and organize some of them around the Now at Work events that are coming up this fall. You can find those, how timely, over at event, uh, servicenow.com slash events.html. Also more about webinars and ServiceNow user group meetups, lots of things. You want to know more? Follow me on LinkedIn and you'll see many, many updates a day. <laughs> Anywhere from zero to a dozen. I don't know how many. It's, it's whatever our uh, social media team has for me to publish to you. I will share as soon as I can. So look for that. 
Keep abreast of what the meetups are. What's in your area? What can you take advantage of? Not just you, but hey, pass it along to your colleagues, your boss, your boss's boss, and say, look, there's a CIO meeting coming up on ServiceNow. I think we should get into this. A lot of good information coming up on that. We would appreciate that very much. We also have knowledge coming up May 3rd through 7th in Orlando. Want to make sure you're thinking about that. Get those ideas going. Call for Speakers is going to be opening before you know it. You want to make sure that you have your spiel, your shtick, your what is it you want to present at one of these breakout sessions about your ServiceNow journey, about what you've learned, whether it's in CreatorCon as a CreatorCon breakout session or in the main knowledge conference itself. So CreatorCon is the conference within a conference that uh, is for developers and builders and admins and people who want to know more about the creation process custom applications and customizing the applications they've got and getting more hands-on into predictive intelligence or service portal widgets, uh, machine learning, metric base, those types of things to help you grow within your ServiceNow ecosystem. And knowledge is, is a little more on the general side. I mean, there's going to be things about, uh, there, there will be hands-on labs, asset management. I'm not trying to say that all the hands-on labs are in CreatorCon, but make sure when you when we do open up registration that you say, hey, I want to go to CreatorCon as well. We will be having some of those around the world. As I mentioned, Now at Work is available. If you go to that events.html page that I just showed you back, where was it? Here, that one. It will have Now at Work as a big banner at the top, and you can find out more. May 3rd through 7th in Orlando. Look forward to seeing you there. Mark your calendars. Start priming the pump. Get your boss excited, get you excited, get your teammates excited. Hope to see you there. And uh, looking forward to going back to Orlando. We haven't been there since 2017. Other event that I want to make sure you're aware of is October 22nd. We will be doing Guided App Creator walkthrough of what those features are. This is the new way of starting application building in New York and beyond. We want to make this as easy as possible for people who are not familiar with the platform. Get some of those line of business people, get some of those process owners, get get some of the, the admins who haven't done development before. When you start up studio in previous releases, it can be sort of a daunting thing. What am I supposed to do first? Where do I go? When do I apply security? When should I be doing forms versus the tables? When, How do I do integrations? There's a lot to it. And Guided App Creator can help walk you through that. Sign up at the link you see at the bottom, bit.ly slash TN69Reg. Hope to see you there. We also want to mention that if I do any code today, it will be stored on GitHub in the repo that you see there, bit.ly slash sn-js, excuse me, sn-cls, <laughs> js is the next one, that uh, you can find these, take them and say, oh yeah, Chuck did this thing to sort users. I want to see that. How was that done? You could go right to this repo, get that script, copy it, take it, make it, break it, do what you want with it. And... If you are new to JavaScript and want to get started, maybe you're an admin and your developers have left the organization. Maybe you're tra thinking about transitioning in your career. There's an opportunity for you to be a developer. Maybe you just want to start poking around on your personal developer instance. That's cool too. I invite you, get started on your ServiceNow JavaScript journey. It's standard JavaScript stuff, but it has some tailored things in this lesson to get you started. And then when you get to the point where you say, all right, I'm ready for the ServiceNow scripting course. You are ready for the ServiceNow scripting course. This is a great primer for that. And go on your merry way, whether it's it's self-paced or instructor-led, or virtual instructor-led, however you want to do that. Or maybe you just want to learn on your own and learn from the community. bit.ly slash sn-learn-js is where you can find all of those videos. I appreciate everybody who's watched those, made comments, just had another comment today on them. Thank you very much. And uh, don't forget, like, favorite, share, whatever it is that you do with those videos, you kids and your YouTube these days. <laughs> Let's get started on the community. I left off on that page. Before we start, I do have a request. Let me just do a quick refresh, see if we are streaming according to YouTube. We are not. So I'm going to have to post the MP4 of this to YouTube in a little bit. Apologize for not being able to interact with you today. Even my phone, oh, my phone did. No, nope. different YouTube notification. Get lots of those during the day. I was getting hopeful. I saw the icon. I went, yes, not so today. So anyway, let's get going. I do have a question from John. John reached out and said, hey, there's a question regarding email notifications from another ServiceNow instance. This customer posted and said, uh, David had posted five hours ago saying, 
we're doing an integration via email where customers are sending in email for uh, our reporting portal is what he calls it. Not really sure what that's all about, but most of the interaction is via email. You send in an email and it creates some sort of record for you. Very common thing with inbound email integrations. If you haven't done that, we looked at them last week and I showed an example of the body text versus the body HTML. So I invite you to go back to whatever it was, October 1st, 2nd, 3rd. I put the links in the show notes and everything in the YouTube description and in the community. These videos are posted back to the community as soon as I make, get them available. So that being said, you've got one ServiceNow instance that sends out a message and you've got another one that sends, it receives the message, but you don't want to get create this loop. So what we have in there is a header that says, this came from ServiceNow, don't create a loop. Well, he's saying that is actually defeating the ability for the inbound system to process that piece of information. And Alan has said back and says, yep, I heard that you have to disable this property, glide.pop3.ignore under headers, which is straight out of the knowledge base that David references. Oh, it wasn't a new window link. So I overwrote that article. I'll have to go back. And this article really spells out the whole situation. What are the options? So it says, you may run into this where this X service now generated colon true mail header is preventing you from receiving and processing mail properly. So the cause is that in fact, that header is true. You can't disable just that one header, unfortunately. You have to use this pop three ignore headers property. So if that's a global property, you'll need to go to the global scope, change that, set that, do what you need to, to do that properly. Uh, the, the knowledge base article really spells it out. Solution one, implement a web service integration. Email is very brittle. It's very prone to errors or issues. Uh, it's, it's really a poor man's integration. And, and you could spend a lot of time managing and maintaining this going forward. Other forms of integration are more robust. You can do better data scrubbing on them. They don't require as much scripting. If you've got you know, integration hub involved, that kind of thing, you could have reusable components. So I invite you to look at that. That should be really your go-to integration. Email between ServiceNow instances is really, I dare I say it, a lazy way of doing it. If that's all you've got from a third-party system, say, hey, they don't support REST. They don't support FTP. They don't support SOAP. They don't support JDBC, whatever it is. Then email is your go-to. But ServiceNow, I mean, it's really fairly easy to set up a table API or a scripted REST API. We've done that a number of times here. So please go look at those as your first options, not your default options. So that's that's my recommendation as well. My, my thought process is right in line with this. I couldn't find anything in this knowledge base article that I would say, hey, go, uh, it, it's, it's, it's not working for you. <laughs> uh, that, that, that contradicts what this is. So if you're implementing email-based integrations, they do have a significant write-up says what could be possibly causing these issues and test the mail. So if, if you make this change, you turn off the headers, odds are there's a high likelihood that somebody's going to come along later and change your email integration process, make a tweak to an inbound action, an outbound notification, and sets up this loop. And it can be rather difficult to find. So if you're on this path, bookmark this article, make sure your successors and your predecessors know about it to say, hey, this is something I changed. This is why. Have a good change log. That's, that's one of the things that I found most useful. Uh, whether it's a comment at the top of a script include or a business rule or whatever, make sure you leave footprints and fingerprints everywhere you go so that people know what you did. It says, I changed this on this date because we had this issue. According to PRB, I needed a workaround. I found a solution in a KB, blah, blah, blah. Here's a link to it. If, if you do, if, if I came across somebody else's code and had a comment like that, you bet I'd be clicking on links and saying, is this still valid? Do we need this? Uh, is it the cause of the problem? So be sure to document. That's just a, a good practice in whatever you're doing, not even specific to this email issue, but everything across ServiceNow documented somewhere. I know people have stories and, and change logs and whatnot. I like to leave mine a little closer to the source, if you will. So 
it, it's not not saying that I don't use stories and change management and release management, that kind of thing, but make sure you you leave a friendly breadcrumb behind, not just for who comes after you, but you may be looking at this two years from now and go, I have no recollection of ever doing this. It's happened to me. I look at things that I built and say, where did I get this from? It might have been copy and pasted, which is why I don't remember building it. But leave those things for others to find. One more quick refresh on YouTube to see if we have a stream yet. It's it's streaming somewhere. I don't know where it's going. I checked everything. Who knows? Maybe I have to uh, set up a new stream, a uh, new feed on their end. Okay, that's John wanted me to check that out. He also had a message. Uh, let's see if I can find it real quick. Oh, glide sys attachment. That's what it was. So he said, how do you copy one attachment? If a record has four or five attachments, let's take an example. I'm going to pick on our favorite table incident and pick an open one. I don't know why I still have an incident menu of favorites. Let's take incident two. I don't know what the state is. I don't know what it's about, but it has one image here. Let's put another image on there. And uh, maybe I can pick something from the desktop. That one looks good. Nice little 11K image. Now I have pasted image and download.jpg. Those are stored in a table called sys underscore attachment. And I say that with a grain of salt. So if I look at when it was last updated, I have download JPEG and somewhere in there it says it's attached to incident. Let me collapse that so we can see a little bit more. Show matching. So there's two pieces of information in here. One is the table name. Says this is the table that is associated with this record or that this record is associated with. The other is the sys ID of the record. And if you were to go out and look at the sys ID for incident 000002, I think I got the number of digits right there, but I'm guessing, that's the sys ID for it. And it says this attachment is on this table. Great. However, you may find that there is another one, pasted image with that same sys ID. If I say show matching, I get two records. Those are the two attachments that I saw at the top. That's how they're rendered. There is a second table, sys underscore attachment underscore doc, which means you have to copy two things. Now, there is a method. If I go out to developer.servicenow.com, glide sys attachment. There is a class called glide sys attachment and it has a method called copy. What you pass it is the source table. Let's say I want to copy these two attachments from incident A to problem B. Source table would be incident. Target table would be problem. Source ID would be the incident sys ID, that one that I had highlighted and did show matching on. The target sys ID would be the problems sys ID. So it would copy all the records, copies attachments from the source record to the target record. John is asking, is there a way to copy just one? Therein lies the challenge, okay? I, that was the, I, all that was for the setup. You need to know which one of these you want to copy. It may have a fixed name. For the sake of argument, we'll say John wants to copy download.jpg. Yes, you can do that, but you cannot do that with the copy attachment method I just showed you here. Glidesys attachment copy. There is delete attachment, there's copy attachment, there's get content, and there's just a couple of methods in here. There's a write, write stream, so you can write content in a number of ways. Very handy if you are, say, creating an attachment that's going to be generated from a while. Anyway, I'm not going to go down that path today. So you'd like a single file version of this. Hmm. Well, my first inclination is to go to my personal developer instance first and 
see if Flow Designer has an action for that. So let's say we're creating a new problem and then we want to attach the record. I know we can do some attachment manipulation. So let's create a new flow called copy attachment and we'll put it in this scope. That way I'll, when I want to blast that scope out of the water, it won't be around. Let's say an incident incident is created or updated or just created is fine. Here, we'll do created or updated. That's fine. Any conditions? Incident. We just need a trigger. I'm not even going to use it because I'll see if it'll test. What I'm really looking for is down here in the actions, we have under ServiceNow Core, scroll up so we can see a little bit more of that. I apologize, it's blown up. Copy attachment. Oh, what did that say? What did that say? It had a description on it. I don't want to read it. Action, ServiceNow Core, copy attachment. Copies and attachment. Oh, put the data panel away so I can actually read it without reducing my font size. Copies and attachment to a target record. The source is an attachment record. You can dynamically add and configure fields for the record. Server-side validation rules are enforced. Data policy, business rules, blah, blah, blah. But UI policy does not apply. Interesting. So theoretically, you could do source attachment, which, where does it come from? Oh, right out of the sys attachment record. Or you could use the data pill picker to say what? Trigger record, incident. How would you get that specific attachment? This feels like more of a case where you've got a template record acting as uh, you know, a template attachment. Maybe it's something, some PDF that you, or a knowledge base article or something you want to stick onto this record. Interesting. So we would attach this to whatever target record. Let's, let's continue on with this. I don't see a way to get the attachment information by going through the data pill picker. So it feels very static. Or as of New York, you could script it here with the little f of x thing and say, go get this specific attachment. And you could script it to say, the you have to re make sure you return a value. Always return a value. Otherwise, your function really doesn't do anything. You could go to sysattachment, look up the download.jpg from that incident record, that would turn it there and then attach it to your target record, which could be your new problem record you just created or looked up or whatever. So that, that feels like a way to do that in a unique way. It does require a little bit of scripting here, which is easier than writing the full on script because this takes care of the whole association between sys attachment and sys attachment doc. If you built this your own way, you would have to manage and develop both of those. I don't want to get into that. That gets a little nasty, and I'd rather leverage something simple that somebody could say, hey, I just need to copy this attachment. This feels like the path of least resistance to me at this point, as of New York, is use Flow Designer, do the copy attachment. I find it interesting that it doesn't copy all attachments, <laughs> at least not according to the description. So. Have fun with that. And let me know, John. Great way to uh, start the morning with a good challenge. Hope that answers your question. Now, where are we on the community? We haven't even started on the community, and it is way into the show, but that's okay. I'm going to go, I'm going to cheat. Well, first, let's, let's scan the unreplied, just all forums, all subcommunities. Variable field dependent on other field. Ah, the good old dependent variables. Hi, all I've configured an incident form for the service portal and I have a number of fields which are dependent on the field above. Our previous implementer had created a wizard for the incident and it looks like the script looks like a script to make the fields dependent. My requirements are the following. Field 1 is organization name. And this shows the company or subsidiary companies the user is assigned to. Easy enough. Field 2 is service currently shows a full list of services which are 
in the business services table, I would like this to only show business services which our selected company is assigned to in the task. This sounds like a reference qualifier. Field three is application, currently shows no value. I would like this only to show the applications which selected service. Field four is the category, currently shows no value, would like it to show the categories. Okay, you're, you're either going to have to do the lookups yourself or possibly reference qualifiers. You may be able to do the first, <laughs> this is, this is going to be a non-trivial effort. You may be able to do the first one with a simple reference qualifier assuming, what was it, business service? Organization name service, assuming service is a reference field, which it sounds like it is. Reference field and the business service table has a company field on it you can filter with on, to, at. I don't know what the right preposition is to end that sentence, so I'm not going to use one. <laughs> Uh, the others would have to be cleared if service changes, if company or service changes. Let's generalize that. The others would have to be cleared anytime a field above it changes. I don't want someone picking the wrong value because it was a leftover from a previous choice of company, service, etc. So a client script is easy, is an easy way to do this. In fact, more specifically, an on change client script. Next, you need the values for all fields below. That involves an unchanged client script on whatever is changing. So you can go look up using Glide Ajax the values you need for the dependent fields. This would be so much easier if we had dependent variables, but never happened. Take a look at episode 33, frequent viewers will know that, of TechNow for an example, how to make dependent fields, dependent variables. This should be variables up here. Don't want to confuse variables with fields. They are two different things. They look the same, they behave similar. How to make dependent variables, uh, yeah, I'm going to leave it like that. And let's link directly to that. So if I go to bit.ly slash servicenow dash technow, frequently used link, and go down to thirty-three. I was trying to come up with thirty-three in another language, but can't right now. Brain is just running too slow. It's focused. Create link HTML, copy that, paste that, boom, link, done, coin. All right, that was fun. Not simple, but it can be done. IT business management, IT operations, IT service management, how to handle Microsoft application upgrade with in ServiceNow Sam Pro. How can I replace or add a retina icon image? What is a retina icon image? Curious. How can I add or customize the icon from the display on the forum? The retina list has many button images to select from, but my customer wants a specific image. If I add customer logo PNG to system UI images, then replace da 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 da, -da with class button default customer logo, the UI macro, I get an empty button, no image. Show me the code. 
assume they want one of those. You do have to modify the UI macro, but that's not where the macro, if I replace, if I add it, yeah. Uh, the UI macro code, I can't think of any macros right now that are defined in that way. Let's find out. UI macro. Oh, I know. Those When it sits next to a reference field like that, it's called a reference field decoration. So let's start in the dictionary. This is reverse engineering. So I'm going to start in the dictionary and look for any field that has an attribute that contains decoration. That's where you specify what those icons are. So next to clone instance, this thing says attributes field decorations, clone target authenticate scripts. That's the name of a UI macro. Now, whether it's available to modify out of the box, we don't know. So let's go to take that name, go to UI macros, and see if that name is something we can get our hands on. It is. There's the UI macro. And how is the icon defined? Somewhere in this code of Jelly JavaScript Jexel is going to be... There's some hidden fields. Here's some script. Maybe I can blow that up to full screen. There we go. Better. It's not going to be in the script. It's going to be in the... Huh. Interesting. Where's the code? Is there an include in here? No. Hidden, 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 hidden. There's no icon. There's no... JPEG, there's no PNG, there's no... All right, let's go pick out a different example. Recent dictionary. I love that recent icon. Use it all the time. KB Knowledge, let's find out. KB Knowledge has one called KB Category Reference Lookup. So let's go back to our macros equals that. I would have expected to see some jelly in there. All I saw was JavaScript. There we are. Uh, we've got a template. We've got another template. We've got another evaluate. Script, 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 done. Where are the macros? Where are the icons? I don't see anything. Did I miss it somewhere? Or is it buried in a template somewhere? It's not in between the evaluates. Interesting that these evaluates are in separate blocks. They could be, uh, it's probably in one of these inlines or includes. Still not getting it. Let's keep going. I'm gonna try one more and then I'm gonna give up. <laughs> Dictionary includes decoration. Only eight of them, interesting. Well, this is curious. I didn't do this one on safety issue. What did I choose? User show incidents. Aha, that's a common one. Let's do that. Macros. User show incidents. There's a general one and there's a general one. Let's pick one. Don't know why we have two. Uh, evaluate. Reference decoration. Image. Okay. Gotta look for... You know what? The icon they had, I don't see what they were looking for. I don't know what that retina icon is for, but somewhere in there you're going to see there's a G reference decoration. I pulled this right out of user show incidents. Okay, let's reply. This example code comes right out of the UI macro. User show incidents. Just to double check, make sure I did type that right. Yes. Somewhere in your code, you should have an image attribute like this. Image is not part of the class. I, well, I, it could be. It could be. 
It, you may have a class that defines an image, but typically that's for like backgrounds or something. Typically, image is defined in the decoration uh, uh, tag, not the class attribute. All right, let's put in a little code snippet. Hey, it's a rare opportunity for me to actually use XML. How about that? I don't know if I can bold that or anything, but almost hit the wrong button. Go with that one. What else have we got? Report on time elapsed between work notes. Ooh, you're gonna need to log that somewhere. Parameterized field, state values. I'm going to go to the developer community, see if there's anything new here. Ooh, Brad's getting close to 100,000. He'll be the third person. How can I replace retina icon? Oh, I already replied to a few of these. Michael Bachmeyer, I just talked to him on LinkedIn the other day. There's a restrict KB article I was by groups. I'm just curious. I want to know what this conversation's about. That's kind of how the community works. I'm trying to restrict knowledge base articles by what group a user is in. I have a field in the create new KB article for a person to choose a group, but I don't know how to write the read ACL script. I don't want to do it by roles because we are trying to avoid creating that many roles since we already have groups. Any ideas? Ashutosh says, sorry, but not clear exactly what you want to clarify properly. Says, if you want, you can create a knowledge base. You can restrict at the knowledge base level. Uh, you absolutely can do this by creating a can read and cannot read fields on the form. What about UI or um, user? I can't remember the name. User criteria. That's it. Doesn't that work on knowledge articles? There's it just on the knowledge base. I think it's on the knowledge base. So let's go to knowledge. Let's see, there's knowledge articles, knowledge bases. All your base are belong to us. And we have at the bottom can read, can contribute, and those are. User criteria, yes. KB user criteria can read, yes. Those are user criteria. Can you do that on an article? I don't believe so. I think this has been asked a number of times. Let's take a user, or excuse me, a KBA. And don't believe you can do that. Configure related lists. And there's no can read, yeah. So what he said is you can absolutely do this, can read, Cannot read fields from the form. Uh, I'm going to include a link to user criteria for New York. Tell me that's New York. How do you know? Yeah, it's user criteria migration. But you know what? When you click that, you often wind up with a better link on the side. Service catalog. Service catalog security. I don't want service catalog. I want knowledge base user criteria. Knowledge base user criteria. I picked the catalog y stuff. Create a user criteria record in knowledge management. That sounds friendly enough. And where can we start? Knowledge management. Configure knowledge management. Little deeper, little deeper. Manager, creator. Select user criteria for knowledge base. Let's start with that. Create link, HTML. Recommend doing this at the knowledge base level using user criteria. That way, when you need to make a change, it's, it's what? It's a, uh, at the higher level and you don't have to update 
a whole bunch of knowledge base articles. Paste link. Oops, show's not over yet. Don't go home. I wanted to hit that. There. Contributing, helping. Automate reminder notifications when state of incident is awaiting user info. This should be easy. It's got five replies. I'm not gonna dig into that one. It's just gonna happen. Let's go back up here, refresh. And let's see if we can find one more real quick. Unreplied, what's unreplied? After running ATF, we are getting an alert on the portal form in console. I can see the error type error, cannot read property get field of undefined. Look for the code that says get field. Parameter state values, how do we, how do we have an email me this chat feature in your, for chatbots virtual agent? Also out of the box methods existing for collating feedback from an end user for a topic. How can I approve an emergency change programmatically? I'm looking for things that contribute to real quickly before I jump topics, mobile development problems. Can we have larger header texts for exported Excel reports? That's an enhancement request. At this point, it's pretty fixed. So uh, at this point, New York, this is not a, an out of box feature. However, I invite you to open an enhancement request. There we are. Nothing new in the inbox. I am going to turn the page. <laughs> I, I thought of a new, uh, we're gonna do a deep dive, but not on, a, it's on a specific topic. This is on a glide record method. I thought a catchy title might be a method to my madness. So what do we have? We need, uh, we need a theme or something. I'll have to find some music that can go with that method for my madness. Cause it's not this one. That's if we want to take a deep dive. Hmm. How about this one? A method to my madness. My madness being, I want to do something. What I discovered recently is a glide record method that can help you do pagination. So if you only want to read, say 50 records at a time, not sure why I was logged out of the developer community, the developer portal, but we'll get back in there quickly enough. And I go to glide record. I know it was right there. It was right there. I discovered, I don't know why that font is so small on me this morning. Must have backed it off. Not training. Class glide record. In here we have. Oh, where'd it go? Glide record V3. Is that even a glide record? It is called. It's not in here. All right, I'm going to search it out the other way since I know what it's already called. Choose window. And this may not even be documented. I can't remember where I found it. There, API choose window. Choose window is part of scoped glide record. I must have been looking in legacy. Okay, so choose window allows you to set a range of records returned by subsequent queries. So think about this. If I have 10,000 queries, and I want to maybe send a rest message with only 50 at a time, because I can bundle them up that way and say, here's 50 records, here's 50 more records, here's 50 more records, and here's 13 at the end. So you now have whatever that is. It's either 163, I wasn't counting, or 213. You can do that very easily with this. Choose window on your glide record query. If I look at it, let's take my personal developer instance, go back to incident, say open, close that, go back to global, just so I'm 
doing things in there. I have 55 records. Let's do a small example of this. Bring up VS Code for me. I'm going to do a little scripting to show you how Choose Window works. We will do a quick glide record query, var not car, inc gr equals new glide record on the incident table. And from that, I'm going to do an inc gr choose window. Parameters were start, count, if I remember right. Where is it? First row, last row. Okay, but somewhere I need to know how many that I want to get at a time. So let's set up some constants at the top or variables that act like constants. Var start equals zero. Var count equals how many do you want at a time? Let's say five. So this will then be start and start plus count. There's a third parameter in there. Let's not do that. Called force count. If true, get row count method will return all possible records. Let's try that with true first. Inc gr.query. Let's sort these by number two. We can put in our other friends, <laughs> our other friendly methods. Called inc gr.order by Let's just sort of be these by number ascending, just to make it a little easier to read the list. All right. Well, inc gr dot next will get each record as long as there are some to retrieve, and gs dot info inc gr dot get value number. We'll just get the number field out of there to list it out, just to show I got five and only five. It's a little different than set limit. Set limit gets the first five or whatever number you put in there and only five. So if I had substituted this with set limit five, I'd get five records. I'd get the same five records, but I couldn't get the next five records. This lets you set up a rolling window of what those are. So you can get the idea. If I put this in a larger loop, I can make it do what I want for pagination. Maybe I've got a long list of records and I need to get them in a uh, paginated format. So let's go to scripts background, paste that in, make it a little bigger so you can read it. And there is one, two, three, four, five. Five records ordered the way I would expect. So if I put this into a function and say, start with, start at record zero, then start at record five, I would then get in fact, let's do that. Let's make this a function. Okay. Function get page of incidents. Very common thing you might want to do. And I'm just going to put in the start number. Where do you want to start? Oh, you know what else I should have done? Found out what that GS, uh, what the, what the row, get row count is doing. So let's do gs.info inc gr.get row count plus records found in this list. Just to put the semicolon on there, see what we get. Back to our function definition. Let's add that out, bring this code into the function. Boring. Watch me tab. I know. I like to separate my variables from my other code. A little few few blank lines can't hurt you. Makes it a little easier to read. Wow, that's annoying. You can't backspace and get spaced on the tab. And then what would we get if we return? We really don't need to return anything, but what we could do is put in a call that says get page of Incidents, plural would be nice. Copy that down here and say start at zero. Let's just make sure it still works the way we expect it to. Back up, paste, run it again. 
83 records found in the list. Okay, there are 83 incidents out there. When I was looking at the list, it was, I think it was saying just 55, might have been just the active ones because I clicked open. Easy to understand. So this is zero through five. If I change this to false, I believe it's just gonna say five. And it says 83 records found in the list. Now I don't know what that third parameter does. It says in the docs, if true, get row count method will return all possible records. I wonder if it's actually querying all those records. Doesn't return a value. Choose window two, four, they're just, okay. I'm stumped as to what that actually does. So never mind that for now. We're going to leave that alone. But we know that we can get all the records to say, hey, this is zero through five. You told me so because let's not reinitialize start in that function. I'm sure some of you are screaming, hey, fix that. If we start at five now, same thing we get six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Very cool. We can get five, send them out a REST API, or put them in a table, or display them on a paginated service portal list, or whatever it is, you come up with it. I needed this because I was asking for all the records in a table, and it was taking forever to render it on service portal. I said, need to come up with some pagination. And that's when I discovered the choose window method. Very useful. You decide what window you want to do, a start and an end. I like to say, somewhere say, I want five records or 50 records, or maybe it's a user preference. Maybe it's a system property. You, you decide how big that window is, and then let choose window figure out where to go from there. Very, very easy. Again, if you want this function to return something, go ahead and build an array, return objects, you decide. Okay, I am going to make a new folder for today's code is going to be called 2019-1008 and call this one windowjs if you're looking for that. Save it and I'll push anything else. Maybe there's another script in here that I need to write. Not going to push it yet. Let's look at the other ideas. That was, oh, Second method to my madness, order by. I was under the misguided, <laughs> the misguided idea that you can only order lists by one field. And that would seem to be the case. Let's go back to not this instance. Well, you know what? This instance is fine. I have lots and lots of songs in here. And if I look at sort by artist A to Z. Well, there's a whole bunch of blank ones in there. Let's go Z to A. Okay, I get ZZ Ward, I get ZZ Top, I get Zuchero. I, okay, you get the idea. On and on and on it goes. I've got lots of songs. If I want to sort by title, you'll get the title inside of these, L, 3, T, P, L, M. It's not sorting, I want a second key. Now, what somebody pointed out to me after I had learned this was that you could do an add sort up here and say, go artist, A to Z, or let's do mine, Z to A, and add a second sort, uh -huh, title. I've got two title fields. One was the original title that came back from YouTube. And let's go A to Z. You know what, let's just sort them both top to bottom run that query, and now it's T, P, P, M, L. This is actually going reverse by title. When I get down to three by 365 days by ZZ Ward, it goes to ZZ Top, Velcro Fly, Tush, Sharp, Dressed Man, Rough Boys, you get the idea. Very cool, you can put multiple sorts on a list. Didn't know that until I dug into this larger data set problem, okay? You may have known it, congratulations. Can you do that in code? The answer is yes. In the previous example, I showed you an order by. Let me, you, you could do the exact same thing here. I say order by number and then put in an additional order by or order by descending to code that same functionality. Very easy. The other thing that's interesting is 
can't copy the query for that. However, up here on the URL, if you take a look at the URL, yep, just a reminder telling me that the show is almost over and I've got something else to do in five minutes. If you look up here, it's got sysparm query equals order by descending u under artist, order by descending u underscore title. So I can do this in a URL query by using the order by and order by desc to tell it which fields to order by. I can also do it in code by stacking up the different order buys. I don't know to what depth you can do this. I probably wouldn't do more than two or three order buys, but it's really just passing that information onto the underlying database, MySQL in my case, to allow you to do that sorting. Very handy, very powerful stuff. Order by multiple layered, because I was coming up with all kinds of ways to try to do this. In the widget, I would have the artist stacked up and then I would take a group of them. I've nested objects. It was really ugly to try and write a sort algorithm on objects within an array of objects within an array of objects. And it was very convoluted and complex. Then I discovered this and went, the database query does it all for me. Why not take advantage of that? So order by, you can have more than one of them in your code to order your, your objects this way. And if we want to do that, we could do that by saying inc gr dot order by uh, sys updated on. Let's take the updated date. And down here, we could also put in updated equals and go to, although they're not grouped, let's do category instead. Let's do category, then number. That would seem to be more fun, wouldn't it? Let's save this. Undo, 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 undo. I, already, I know I already saved all this. So I don't have to do this. I don't want to mess with my original script. Let's put it in here. Okay. Get, get incidents, get sorted incidents. We don't need the window start. We don't need start. We don't need a count. We just need our friendly list of incidents sorted by not by a tart. Am I missing anything? It's on this list. We don't need that, but we do need category and number. We'll just put in a space. Inc. Gr dot get value number. So what I'm going to do is sort by category. I'm not sure what categories there are. Let's call sorted incidents down here. Don't need a number there. See what happens. Go back to my PDI, script background, paste, run, and I get there's null category. Now these are 1844, 4855, sorted numerically. Then I've got database, sorted numerically. Then I've got hardware, sorted numerically. And then I've got inquiry. So I can do a sort within a sort automatically in script, similar to what the I could do the same thing with state. In fact, let's do, yeah, let's do state numerically. That'll show us a little bit different perspective. One, all the, all the incidents that are in state one, remember that states have a value, it's an integer. So therefore I can sort one, two, three, four, five. They have a display value that is text, a label. Don't mix those up. You may go, well, Work in progress comes before close complete. That's not alphabetic. It's not sorting alphabetic. We told it to sort on the value. There's three, there's seven. You can see within each of these, I've got numeric sorting. Very handy. Very, very handy to be able to do that. So that brings us to the top of the hour. Thank you for joining. I'm going to go back to the, where is it? 
community. Just to sign off, I hope you found something useful that you can take to your organization, maybe even mildly entertaining. Click that like button, click the helpful if you see it in the community and appreciate it very much so that other people know that there's something of use in here that they can possibly take advantage of. I will post the code to the community to get this video up with all the links that we've discussed, discussed today and talk to you again real soon. Take care. Bye.